Here we are in online lecture eight. We're going to focus in on map animation. And we'll also at the end take a look at flow maps, which really isn't a type of animation uh, per se, but it does show movement. That's the whole idea here. So the idea of animation, not really a new, something new. I mean, we've seen, you know, 1920s, 30s cartoons in which, of course, you know, you have a particular image, you draw it, uh, and then you make the next one slightly different than the previous one, and it shows change as you then combine, you know, a series of many, many photos, many images that are all slightly different than the previous one, and then it's going to create the illusion of movement. Now, that's quite obvious, but it's that same idea we're going to continue to think about when we're making map animations. It's actually an easier process than what it might uh, be on, on the surface in terms of all we're doing is just creating many static images uh, that, of course, uh, depict a change over time or over an area. Now, it really wasn't until Waldo Tobler, once again, that name comes up, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, to first utilize animation with maps. And so what he did was he created a study uh, that looked at Detroit. And so what, essentially what he did was he modeled the residential patterns kind of using a 3D animation. And essentially what he did was this static images, 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970. So then he started modeling what's going to look like if the trends continue, 1980, 1990. And so this was before really computers were really, you know, widespread, of course, way before the internet. And so the idea here was a very early example of taking static images and then combining them together to create the illusion of change, the illusion of animation. But in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when I was in cartography school, we didn't do any map animation. Why? Well, one reason was we didn't have really the tools. I mean, computers weren't really advanced enough at the time uh, for us to do animations without the thing all bogging down. So if you think ArcGIS is slow now, ho, ho, ho. How about the late 1990s trying to run a map animation uh, in ArcGIS? Not an enjoyable experience. Or there's just essentially a lack of funds. It's not a lot of, like a lot of interest in uh, making uh, map animations, which, okay, I, I get that. Uh, further, there's kind of a, a you know, we think about academic research, you know, one of the things is this negative view of animation is because so much of the stuff is, you know, we put it in journals, we put it in 300 page dissertations and thesis and documents. Um, so essentially those are all mediums that aren't useful for movies and for animations. And so, of course, digital uh, journals have kind of opened up the door for more animation, more map animation to be included into uh, academic research. But another reason why we just don't see it a lot. Even further, like I mentioned, ArcGIS, they've kind of dominated this particular industry. So that, you know, they've pretty much controlled it. And so they are really starting to invest more into their map animation. Uh, but it wasn't really something that they were doing as cartography, computer cartography, digital cartography, GIS uh, was taking their, taking off there in the early 2000s. Another thing I want to mention is the fact that map animation, what kind of a key difference about it compared to, let's say, static maps, is that in map animation, you actually control what the map viewer is looking at. For example, if you have animation showing change over time from 1890 to 1910, 1920, 30, 40, 40, 60, you have control as far as, okay, you're now looking at the 1990 map. And you're going to look at it for 10 seconds. And then I'm going to move it and you're going to look at the 2000 map. And then you're going to look at it for 10 seconds and so on. Further, you might be able to look over a particular area. For example, I might do a fly flyover map. So right now, I'm flying over Indianapolis. Now I'm going to take you to Chicago, and I'm going to move to a different location. So that's essentially changing your view as the map viewer of as far as what you see. You were seeing Indianapolis. Now you're seeing Chicago. You don't have a choice in that. You're going to see Chicago for 10 seconds, and I'm going to move to Detroit. So the idea there is essentially the creator, the cartographer, has a whole lot more control as far as what the map viewer is looking at, studying, viewing, and how long they actually see it. Here's Waldo Tobler's visualization that utilized map animation uh, from computers that helped to generate kind of this actual population growth from 1930 to 1940 and so forth. So these are individual timestamps in which you layer on top, it creates the illusion of movement. And then from that, 
He then forecasted what it would look like continuing on from 1960 to 2000. Keep in mind, this was in the 60s-ish when this particular uh, uh, computer-generated map animation was created, the first of its kind. Now, the same visual variables mentioned earlier this semester for what we call static or paper maps are also applicable to animated maps. However, these variables that you see listed here are specific to map animation. Duration is essentially the length of time a particular frame is displayed. So if I have a bunch of, of, of frames that are, let's say, one second, and all of a sudden I have one that's, let's say, five seconds, of course, that's going to be more of something in which the viewer is going to have more attention to because they see it for five seconds, where the other ones they only see for one second. So with the duration, a particular frame can be emphasized or one could be de-emphasized based on how long that frame is visible to the map viewer. Rate of change is pretty obvious. It's the speed that the animation goes through. So you might know this when you're watching a video or listening to a podcast in which you speed it up or slow it down based on you know whether or not you want to listen to it at the regular speed or do you want to fly through it or do you really want to hear every single word said at 0.5x speed that's rate of change magnitude of change is magnitude over duration so just think about how much change occurs from one frame to the next and so if there's a big amount of change happening throughout the frames and i might not be able to see everything there's so much magnitude of change happening but it, then there's other times where if you have an animation where not much is happening from frame to frame, it's really not going to keep my interest, but it's also really not showing me anything of interest. Order, kind of, kind of obvious here. Sequence of frames, we usually typically do it in chronological. Maybe you want to reverse it. You see some examples, I think the book shows, as far as when you want to emphasize things, and so you put the ones you want to emphasize at the end uh, and the ones that don't. Uh, but that can obviously create confusion when we're splitting up time and rearranging it. Display date, that's essentially just the time when something happened that, that, that caused a change. So we might look at times of year, you know, we might look at decades, 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, or might be, the display date might be every year, or it might be January 1st uh, of a particular year. Uh, it might be January 2nd, who knows, whatever. That's essentially the display date. Synchronization, that's when we have two or more time series and we want to link them up, we want to sync them up in which they have a correspondence. And so we have two different things, let's say vegetation and precipitation. And we want to sync them or synchronize them so that when we show the time, January is January on both of them and July is July for both of them. So that's synchronization. Back in 2008, I presented an academic geography conference, this particular map animation that looks at the changing locations of Formula One. Uh, it's an automobile racing association, their location of their race venues over time. Purposes are really to show those particular visual variables of animated maps that I just described. So what we see here is the display date, and it starts at 1950, and we go through each year, each calendar year. I put them in order chronologically, uh, very logically. Uh, I also set the duration for each of the, sl uh, of the particular uh, slides, let's say, or frames uh, to be a half second, except for those at the end of a decade. Those are two seconds long. So we think about rate of change and duration uh, using those particular terms. I'm really wanting to focus in on those end of the decade years in which I show the mean center and the standard distance for that particular time. So I'll go ahead and put this animation in motion. And so here we see 1950, this is a two second pause. Each of these individual years are a half second. Then we see that duration go to two seconds. Then it speeds up in between, then slow it down. Really want to emphasize these in between years for me in this particular case, I'm not, I'm just wanting to kind of show changing over time. Uh, I really wanting to focus in on those decades, as you can see here with the mean center and the standard distance. Get to 2000 and eventually then we have a one second uh, where I then show each of these for the decade. And so we have an animated map that uses a lot of those key terms that I just described. Here's an example of synchronization we can have on the left, the uh, map of vegetation, and on the right, precipitation. And when we synchronize them, we definitely see relationships between vegetation and rainfall. Uh, but what's nice is by syncing them up, by having them both be the same month, same year, what we can do is we can have a nice, animated map here that then compares two different things, two different variables. 
Now let's talk about some categories of map animation or some types of map animation. These are essentially where you're stuck with, you have to use one of these. Uh, like many of these particular things we talk about in the course, here's you know, one or many uh, ways to uh, make an animated map. And so essentially what, I can, what I'm trying to say is you can have a time series map that's also a flyover. So it doesn't have to be where it has to be in this one category and it can't be in another. So a time series map. Uh, this is the most commonly used ones. We just saw that one. And so when we looked at the Formula One changing venues over time, that's a time series map. Re-expression, this is a little bit harder to explain, uh, but I have a video that shows uh, Google Maps, how it essentially accumulates all of the traffic data for an entire year and then kind of reorganizes it and says, okay, well, here's what we would expect on a Monday at 7 a.m. Here's what we would expect on a Tuesday at 5 p.m. in terms of traffic. Um, so essentially what that's doing is it's taking annual data uh, that's in, you know, all those individual dates that are all then summarized and then recategorizes it based on a certain hour of certain time of day uh, instead of, let's say, you know, August 31st from 2012 or whatever it might be. Flyby or flyover, this is kind of the, you know, kind of as it, the name implies, you just kind of, you fly over, uh, move over an area with the 3D animation really helping to uh, to, to, to show that. Uh, it gives you the view that you're kind of flying over, you're flying by something from an aerial perspective. So all of these three here, what they do is they change the position. So flyover, we're going to change your position. Could be changing the attribute, like this free re-expression, changing it from annual data and then making it now Mondays. This is Mondays at 7, Mondays at 10, and so on. And then time series, of course, we're going to be changing time. We're going from maybe a year, a day, a second, whatever it might be. There's also animated maps that emphasize location. Some examples would be some we see on the news when you have a breaking news alert and it shows the Doppler radar and it shows these flashing lightning strikes during a storm. That's emphasizing the location of those particular lightning strikes, that flashing, uh, you know, the, 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 the white uh, lightning bolt uh, that flashes and pulses, kind of draws you to that. Okay, there, right there is that particular uh, of storm activity. Also, there's an example of an earthquake map out there, and what it does, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but it shows the most recent earthquakes that are happening throughout the world, and it shows the most, most recent ones by pulsing them, uh, making them show in a kind of a, a, a bright, brighter and bigger uh, symbol so that the viewer can then see, okay, this is the location of the most recent quake. Now, one of the things about map animations is kind of, uh, is they're, they're cool, they're, they're nice and neat and all that, but oftentimes the viewer doesn't know what they're looking at. And so this is a term called change blindness. When there's so much stuff happening that the changes that are trying to be shown, changes that are, are maybe uh, are important, uh, are missed. Uh, so that's called change blindness when we have this too much happening. And so this is where animation, you have to be cautious of duration, rate of change, magnitude of change. Is my audience missing out on too much stuff because I'm going too fast? Or is there not enough change happening? And so that's kind of the, the thing when we think about map animations, uh, we need to be aware of our audience and their limitations. This here is an animation. It was made in ArcGIS Pro, which is a good example of a time series map. All it is is 3D imagery from 1890, and I have 12 of them, 1900, 1910. So I have 12 different maps, essentially, that are images, let's say. And all I'm doing is fading in one after the other. So there's overlaying the other. And it's creating, the, I guess, the illusion of animation, as if these townships are growing and shrinking over time. So I'll go ahead and I'll put this sucker in motion. And this can be done in ArcGIS Pro by using keyframes. So you can say, okay, 1900 keyframe it. 1910 keyframe it, and so you can do it that way in terms of using an animation, or you can just simply just export these as images and then put them in a PowerPoint, put them into whatever, and then have it, you know, transition, let's say every five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever it might be. So let's go to pause it. Quick analyzation here. We got some patterns, of course, downtown Indy uh, heavily, but you can see the growth of the suburban areas starting to pop up around that. Look at Gary, Fort Wayne, the South Bend area. Terre Haute, you can see that over there. So we kind of can see our different urban areas uh, over time, but we can see how really historically Indianapolis and Central Township, the Center Township, has had huge population uh, for a long amount of time. However, we get to 
the 1970s, and you can see how it actually comes back down and continues to shrink. And so what's happening is Center Township has had a depopulation over time. Now, that's not saying Indianapolis is seeing a large outmigration. The rest of the county, the rest of the city is growing. The other townships have grown. But you can also see how the suburban areas, although here are the particular viewpoint, the southern and eastern is what you can see. Nonetheless, it shows suburbanization. 1990 and then 2000. So essentially what we have is just the illusion of these townships growing and shrinking as I just put a time series map, a collection of maps together and just make it what a, I don't know, 30 second video out of it. This here is a map from FlightAware, as it says there in the bottom left. It's a web map that utilizes a time series uh, map that creates the illusion of map animation. So we can see this is sped up eight times. So this is eight times fast, but every second, uh, each of those individual symbols or points uh, on the map are essentially moved to a different location. Of course, all of this is being tracked by uh, you know, radar, GPO, whatever it might be. Uh, so essentially giving those real-time updates that are changing every second and making it look like the planes are moving over time. All this is is just a good example of time series maps that we see uh, out there in the real world. ArcGIS Pro has something called the Swipe Tool, uh, which is kind of an animation or visualization uh, tool. Uh, there's some things you need to note when using it. First off, if we have two variables, uh, you need to have them both on, so both of them checked, and have them both at the top. Uh, so those will be essentially the, the two variables considered by ArcGIS Pro. So let's go ahead and we'll click on one of the particular layers. Let's go ahead and the, click on the top one. This is going to show population density for Indiana townships in 1890. If I go up to appearance, you'll see the swipe option is right there. Go ahead and I'll click that. And what it does is if I start up here at the top and I go down, it essentially reveals the layer below it, which is the population density in 2000. And so we can go back and forth. And so this is a cool way if you want to show or compare and contrast two things, we can do anything. Uh, you can compare and contrast two remotely sensed images. Uh, so you could have two satellite photos of the same exact uh, location, uh, one from one particular time and another from another time, and then you can compare and contrast. And to use this, if we want to swipe from left to right, we just have to go way over here. Notice it's up and down here in the middle, but if I go way over here, it then goes up to the left or right swipe. And so now I'm going to swipe left to right. And of course, you can zoom in, zoom out in particular areas and compare and contrast. So this is the swipe tool, another animation. Now I'm going to walk you through an animation I made in RJS Pro. This is a particular, essentially an example of a flyby or flyover. So this is from a particular GIS course. If you took my GIS course, uh, the very last exercise is the time space path one in which you plot this over time. Uh, but we're here, we're just going to do a flyover of my bike ride. Uh, so this was a bike ride from way back when. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in play. And so what this has done is how you do this is you set certain keyframes. And these keyframes are essentially the image or the, the view that you want the flyby to go through. And so then you go to, and so I, all I have on this particular flyover is six keyframes, six essentially views that I want the ArcGIS Pro to show. And so as it flies by, as it flies through these particular six keyframes, it then connects the dots by creating a path. So it essentially makes it a smooth path by adding all these individual frames in between my six keyframes. So that would be, I guess, an example of interpolation once again, in which it's interpolating the view in between each frame that I designate. So I'm going to go ahead and put this sucker in motion. So it's a little fast here, but this is my particular route. Uh, so I start over by what is, uh, I guess, now Kroger. I don't know, or was a marsh way back when. Uh, here's actually where I was living. I was living in the Blachern. I was living here in this apartment complex right across from uh, the War Memorial. So here I went down and around. So I was just hanging out in my neighborhood. And so here is a particular keyframe is right about here. So here's the keyframe in which I selected about here. And so from that first keyframe, which we started off this particular video, here's the second keyframe. And so I said, oh, I want to have this particular view. I want to have it go right down this particular street here. And I want to see how I went kind of around uh, the, the, the block near uh, the War Memorial and the 
University Park here. So now we take this sucker, keep it on moving. And so now I wanted to have a keyframe because we wanted to go over the down. I want to have that view of going over the downtown buildings, uh, the skyscrapers. And then as I go back down across, the reason why this DEMs here is kind of helps to show the canal. As I went back over across the canal, and then we have going down New York Street over through the back through here. And so here's the VA hospital cut through the corner there. Hooked back up with a path here along uh, the river. Made it across the street. And you'll note, I can't remember what this building is called, like the alumni or the athletic or something. Uh, but this building is no longer. This is actually under construction. It's now a, uh, a, a, a apartment complex and residence. And it was under construction. So I came down through here and kind of screwed around, played around, and then went back on my merry way, kind of following the path. And ended up over here at my ending point right along the canal at a friend's house. So this was my particular bike path in which I started off at the Kroger, went around the War Memorial, and then down New York Street through IUPY's campus and around. And I did a flyover here, all this being done in ArcGIS Pro.